Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is July 27, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 36. For three generations the Rockefeller dynasty has been a dominant factor in the economic, political, and social life of America, and for three decades four Rockefeller brothers of the third generation David, Nelson, Lawrence, and John D. III have been the real rulers of the Western world. Long ago they carved up the world into spheres of influence, but by coordinating their activities and working as a unit the four brothers have held unparalleled sway over the fate of all mankind. But three years ago this month in AUDIO LETTER No. 2 I revealed that the brothers were beginning to lose their iron grip on events. For example, Nelson Rockefeller had been planning to replace then-President Gerald Ford in the Oval Office no later than June 1975, but Ford survived the strange illness that sent him crashing down stairs and aircraft ramps during that month and he has had no more falling spells in the three years since then. A few months later, in September and October 1975, a rash of assassination attempts almost removed Ford from the scene, but those two were bungled. Two years ago this month, in AUDIO LETTER No. 14, I revealed that the underwater missile crisis of 1976 was underway. This crisis, which the government has never made public, was only the beginning of a total military double-cross of the Rockefellers by their secret ally, the Soviet Union. As I have made public the previous spring in AUDIO LETTER No. 12, key trustees of the Rockefeller-controlled major foundations had already concluded that a Russian double-cross was imminent but the brothers themselves had not agreed with that conclusion. They had grown up knowing that the Soviet Union was secretly financed and dominated by their own Rockefeller cartel. They simply could not imagine that Russia might somehow slip from their grasp. Only when a Russian hydrogen bomb was recovered from the waters of Seal Harbor, Maine, did the four brothers really believe that a military double-cross was underway? I had given its exact navigational coordinates in AUDIO LETTER No. 15 for August 1976, and it was removed late that month by the United States Navy. This bomb was one of the topics I discussed with General George S. Brown, then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in my meeting with him at the Pentagon on September 16, 1976. Once they knew that Russia truly was preparing for a surprise nuclear attack on America, the brothers could have taken steps to prevent war altogether, but that would have involved letting the public in on the truth, and as our Lord has said, the truth shall make you free. The Rockefeller brothers are not interested in your freedom and mine, but in ever more power so they tried to reinstate their alliance with the Soviets, and in order to reestablish the carefully controlled joint plan for nuclear war on American soil, the Rockefellers made tremendous concessions to appease the Kremlin. One of these concessions led to the opening of the doors for Soviet nuclear saboteurs to swarm all over the United States, planting nuclear mines, large and small, at dams, reservoirs, public buildings, manufacturing plants, grain elevators, refineries, and many other targets. For that reason, at this time last year my AUDIO LETTER was in a state of voluntary suspension. For three months, from late May to late August 1977, I cooperated with concerned citizens nationwide in an effort to bring about decisive exposure and official action to stop the wholesale nuclear sabotage of America. But those efforts failed, my friends, as I revealed for you last August when I resumed the AUDIO LETTER with Issue No. 25. Through all of these events and more, the declining power and resolve of the Four Brothers was becoming more and more apparent. 
but all of these setbacks paled into insignificance beside America's disastrous defeat in space last September. In the Battle of the Harvest Moon, the secret American moon base in Copernicus Crater was knocked out. Armed with powerful beam weapons able to strike any spot on Earth, the Copernicus base had been the Rockefeller's ace in the hole in the war to come, but now it was gone. This decisive space battle still has not been admitted publicly by the government but is the real reason for the many desperate anti-Russian moves now underway by America. My friends, we are plunging into a period of confrontation diplomacy on the road to war. Nations great and small are lining up and taking sides for the great conflict to come, just as happened before World Wars I and II. At the same time, the bone-chilling winds of Bolshevik Revolution are sweeping across the land, in America, in Britain, and parts of Europe. To this end, the manipulated collapse of Western monopolistic capitalism is accelerating, led by the fall of the gold-poor American dollar. The West is being thrown into the most critical period in all its history by the Rockefeller Brothers. Yet this is happening as the final decline of the Rockefeller dynasty is accelerating. Last month I pointed out the historical fact that all true dynasties have a lifespan of only about 100 years. That point has already been reached by the Rockefeller dynasty, and the Rockefeller brothers are already in the twilight of their power. And earlier this month, on July 10, 1978, the downfall of the Rockefeller Brothers took a stunning new turn. John D. Rockefeller III, the eldest of the four brothers, was killed in a head-on collision as he rode in a car near the family estate in Pocantico Hills, New York. The crash was supremely ironic for reasons I will explain in Topic No. 1, but more than that, it dealt a crippling blow to the unit comprised by the four brothers and it is a blow that has further increased the pressure on David, Nelson, and Lawrence to hurry up with their plans for revolution and war. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, The Legacy of the Late John D. Rockefeller III, Topic No. 2, The New American Strategy for a First Strike, and Topic No. 3, the Aftermath of Nuclear War One. Topic No. 1 Normally, my friends, it's in poor taste to speak negatively of those who have departed, but the automobile accident that took the life of John D. Rockefeller III did not alter the truth of what I have told you for years while he was still alive, and it did not undo terrible plans he helped to set in motion that will still affect your life and your future. John D. Rockefeller III was one of the most powerful men on earth. The controlled major media have covered up the true significance of his life and death, but I believe you have a right to know. Long ago public relations experts outfitted him with the public image he wore for the rest of his life that of a kindly, shy philanthropist. Even in death this image is being carefully preserved through public relations stories about his funeral in the controlled major media. It was John, we are told, who delighted most in giving away the family fortune and who devoted his life to this task. But, my friends, the fact is that John played an indispensable role in expanding the Rockefeller Empire coordinating his activities with those of his brothers. Of the four brothers, it was John who specialized in several areas that are now of crucial importance to you. One area was that of the Rockefeller-controlled foundations, whose philanthropic halo has little to do with their true nature. Another area was Asia, especially Japan. A third area was that of Africa and a fourth focus of John's was his so-called Second American Revolution 
which is now degenerating into a new Bolshevik revolution here in America. As the 20th century was dawning nearly eight decades ago, John D. Rockefeller, Sr. was launching the first of his tax-exempt foundations. It was called the General Education Board. In 1904 the Board issued its first publication called Occasional Letter No. 1 by John D. Rockefeller, Sr. and his shrewd assistant, Rev. Frederick Taylor Gates. This document, for which I quoted over two years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 10, made clear the true purpose of the Board. This objective was nothing less than to completely remake society according to Rockefeller blueprints. The same purpose has continued to motivate every foundation in the Rockefeller orbit since then, but each foundation specializes on some particular aspect of this overriding goal. In establishing one foundation after another, John D. Rockefeller Sr. coordinated his actions from the outset with Andrew Carnegie, who was doing the same thing. In this way they avoided duplication and increased the scope of their joint efforts. In the area of so-called philanthropies, the Rockefeller and Carnegie interests were intertwined and gradually they all came completely under the Rockefeller umbrella. But on January 26, 1917, Senator Chamberlain of Oregon rose to give a warning on the floor of the United States Senate. He said, quote, The Carnegie-Rockefeller influence is bad. In two generations they can change the minds of the people to make them conform to the cult of Rockefeller or the cult of Carnegie, rather than to the fundamental principles of American democracy." Unquote. Today it is two generations later, and we hear no more warnings like this in Congress. The prophetic warning of Senator Chamberlain has come true. The Rockefeller Carnegie conglomerate of foundations long ago unleashed evil forces directed at education, at government, at the very fabric of society, and for nearly four decades, beginning in 1931, it was John D. Rockefeller III who, of the four brothers, served as custodian of these evil forces. Starting with his trusteeship of the General Education Board and the Rockefeller Foundation, he extended his influence throughout the dynasty's foundation network, which he also enlarged. But now the evil forces unleashed so long ago are out of control. John D. Rockefeller III's coordination of foundations on behalf of his three brothers and himself has now led to double-cross and the commitment for a one-world government and nuclear war to come. Another area of attention became a preoccupation of John D. III even before the foundations, and that was Asia. It began in 1929 when as a fresh college graduate he traveled to Kyoto, Japan, under the sponsorship of the Rockefeller-controlled Institute of Pacific Relations, or IPR. During the 1930s the number one priority of the IPR was to maneuver Japan into attacking the United States under conditions that would serve Rockefeller interests. John D. III threw himself eagerly into this work and greatly expanded Rockefeller activity in Asia through other avenues as well. It was he who supervised the preparations of the Rockefeller Empire to take advantage of coming events in Asia. The IPR spawned the infamous Richard Sorga spy ring with headquarters at Lee, Massachusetts. After the war, Congressional investigations proved that it was the Sorga ring that brought about the Pearl Harbor attack. Guided by information from the IPR spy ring, Franklin Delano Roosevelt made all the necessary preparations to ensure that the desired Pearl Harbor attack would backfire on the Japanese. Two months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 34 I explained the master strategy behind all this. Most members of the public at large had no idea that war with Japan was imminent because the government did not want us to know. 
perhaps the only clear public warning, was that heard on November 9, 1941, by the Congregation of Christ Church in Alexandria, Virginia. The Rector, Bishop Wells, had heard the news only three days earlier from Norman Davis, then President of the American Red Cross, as I told you in detail in AUDIO LETTER No. 22. Davis was very close to FDR and told Bishop Wells that war with Japan would erupt within five weeks. Bishop Wells, shaken by this news, immediately alerted his congregation. Four weeks later the Pearl Harbor attack took place. When war broke out, John D. Rockefeller III promptly made himself assistant quote unquote, to the same Norman Davis who had told Bishop Wells of the coming war with Japan. From there John moved from one position to another, setting the stage for a complete Rockefeller takeover of Japan after the war. As soon as World War II ended, John D. Rockefeller III and his entourage swooped down upon the ruins of Japan. To a people destitute in the aftermath of war, financial resources of Rockefeller proportions can buy almost anything and everything, and they did just that. Soon the mammoth Rockefeller cartel of thousands of Japanese enterprises the Zabatsu began emerging. Much of the early industrial rebirth in Japan under Rockefeller control was in the area of electronics, for which the Japanese have an enormous aptitude. One of the most famous Rockefeller enterprises in Japan in this realm is that of Sony, whose products have penetrated every nook and cranny of the world. Sony, my friends, is not a Japanese name or word, but an acronym. It stands for the former Standard Oil of New York. Today Japan is making a bid to become the number one power in electronics in the entire world. At the funeral of John D. Rockefeller III this month, more than half of the cables and telegrams came from associates in Japan, but John's expertise in the Far East went far beyond Japan to include all of Asia. Today, as the United States is trying to play the so-called China card against Russia, Japan is being pushed into Red Chinese arms to assist in this desperate strategy. But the fact is that Red China has no intention of establishing a real alliance with the United States against Russia. Instead, China is playing the America card knowing that Russia is now the foremost military power on earth. The Chinese hope by their current strategy to extract the best possible terms later as the price of a restored alliance with Russia. Japan, too, squeezed between East and West, is trying to follow a course that is not at all what the Rockefeller Brothers meant to accomplish. With very active treaty bargaining underway now between Red China and Japan, China has been trying to include a clause against regional domination by a single power, a clause which is considered anti-Russian by the Kremlin. Moscow has singled out this one clause as its only objection to a Sino-Japanese treaty, and now Japan has decided to insist on including an auxiliary clause that clearly states that the Regional Domination Clause is not directed against any specified third power. In this way Japan hopes to satisfy both Russia and China. In this way Japan is becoming the pivot point for the giant new Asian axes I first warned about five years ago in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar. And so the legacy of John D. Rockefeller III lives on after him in the Far East. After five decades of destructive meddling in Asian affairs, he has suddenly left the scene just when his brothers need him most. In Asia as elsewhere, the brothers are losing control, and with John gone this trend will start accelerating. Three decades ago the Rockefeller dynasty was only beginning to cash in on the takeover of Japan by means of World War II, but already John D. III was looking around hungrily for the next great prize to devour. 
he found what he was looking for in Africa. In the early fall of 1948 John D. III took a two-month trip to Africa under the auspices of the Rockefeller Foundation. He returned bubbling over about the unparalleled natural resources of Africa and the great commercial and industrial potential of the continent. In an interview with the New York Times on November 14, 1948, he explained his trip as having been motivated by great concern over the health and welfare of the natives, but his true preoccupation was economic and was so strong that he almost gave it all away during the interview. Time and again his Public Relations Counselor had to bring him back to the supposed subject of native welfare so that the New York Times would have something to quote on that topic. As always, the strategy of Rockefeller takeover in Africa was to involve turmoil and bloodshed. Africa's troubles really began after John's trip there 30 years ago. It was not long until he publicly revealed what lay ahead for Africa in a speech on January 18, 1951. He said, quote, it will not be many years before the same kind of upheaval now appearing in Asia will be witnessed in Africa." Unquote. And he was true to his word. Soon words like Mau Mau entered the language of a horrified world as incidents of interracial butchery and terrorism began to multiply. European colonial holdings in Africa began to disintegrate. New nations sprung up in their places with nominally black governments, but in every case the new black governments found it necessary to bring back the white man to manage and develop the economic resources, and Rockefeller multinational corporations swooped down and took over established mining and other activities with virtual freedom from effective local government interference. Until recently, the Rockefeller inroads into Africa were being accomplished in secret alliance with the Soviet Union, but since the Battle of the Harvest Moon ten months ago all this has changed. Under the former joint Rockefeller-Soviet plans there was no hope for survival of Southern Africa. The Rockefeller brothers and their then Russian allies were bent on complete domination in Africa and elsewhere. But the type of domination sought by the Kremlin today is far different in character. As a result, if Southern Africa can hold out against the buffeting that has already been set in motion, there is now a new ray of hope that did not exist before. At the present time Rhodesia is on the front lines, and fighting is underway now near Salisbury, the capital. Two guerrilla forces are involved. One under Robert Mugabe is based primarily in Mozambique and is Soviet-sponsored. The other, under Joshua Nkomo, is based in Zambia and is Rockefeller-sponsored. And just as the Rockefeller-Soviet alliance has been terminated elsewhere, it is a thing of the past in Africa. This month fifteen of Mugabe's officers were recruited away from him by Nkomo with large amounts of Rockefeller money. By the same token, Nkomo has just executed a high-ranking officer in his ranks for being pro-Russian. Increasingly, the Mugabe and Nkomo factions will be fighting each other as proxies of Russia and the United States. Each will race to beat the other to try to take over Rhodesia. Ultimately, the legacy of John D. Rockefeller III in Africa will be a complete failure with Russia picking up what is left of the Rockefeller chips. Africa, like the rest of the world, will be forced to make its peace with Russia, but the domination of Africa by the new breed in the Kremlin today promises to be less drastic and destructive than what would have taken place under the Rockefeller corporate socialist dictatorship. The manner in which John D. Rockefeller III met his death was supremely ironic in view of his role in the ravaging of Africa. The chief Rockefeller agent in Zambia today in the war against Southern Africa is United States Ambassador Stephen Lowe. 
It was his nephew, 16-year-old David Lowe, who died along with John D. Rockefeller III when their cars crashed head-on, July 10, 1978. There remains one more critical realm in which the legacy of John D. Rockefeller III must be mentioned. I refer to a so-called Second American Revolution which is now being transformed into a Bolshevik Revolution here in America. Three years ago this month in AUDIO BOOK TALKING TAPE No. 4 I exposed the secret new Constitution for America that had been written for the Rockefeller Brothers. The product of ten years, 100 participants, 40 drafts, and many millions of dollars, the secret new Constitution was completed in 1974 by a Rockefeller tax-exempt foundation. The secret Rockefeller Constitution is a parody of what our forefathers created in 1787 using high-sounding phrases. It is a blueprint for complete corporate socialist dictatorship. The propaganda campaign to set the stage for acceptance of the secret new Constitution was the responsibility of John D. Rockefeller III. In 1973 he published a book entitled The Second American Revolution, and articles and interviews on the subject followed. Then on March 31, 1975, a full-page ad entitled A Bicentennial Declaration appeared in the New York Times. The ad was sponsored by John's so-called National Committee for the Bicentennial Era and paid for by Rockefeller corporations. It was repeated in other publications nationwide and was intended to be an echo of the Communist Manifesto as a starting gun for change. That campaign fizzled in its original form, but all the machinery of revolution is being cranked up again now. This time the goal is a Bolshevik Revolution here in the United States with the Rockefeller Brothers in the driver's seat. In AUDIO LETTER No. 14 two years ago this month I mentioned a very important lesson the four brothers learned from their sponsorship of Adolf Hitler. Explaining the success of the Nazi Revolution from the vantage point of 1936, Hitler said, quote, It is not enough to overthrow the old state, but that the new state must previously have been built up and be practically ready to one's hand." Unquote. That is why, as I revealed last December 1977, in AUDIO LETTER No. 29, governmental positions at all levels in the United States are fast being packed with Bolsheviks, many of them recently expelled from Soviet Russia. When the revolution takes place soon, they will be in a position to take over, under the leadership of Nelson Rockefeller, of course. Economically, the first winds of revolution are already stirring across the land. Strikes in key industries and public services are becoming rampant, and as the cutting edge of the Bolshevik Revolution, the so-called Taxpayers' Revolt is already underway. Americans have forgotten that it was the cry of down with taxes, no taxes, that the Bolsheviks used in 1917 to help seduce the Russian people. So cleverly is this being done now that it has been portrayed as a conservative cause, and Americans are on the verge of stampeding to their own slaughter. My friends, earlier this month John D. Rockefeller III was killed in a head-on collision on a highway, but his surviving three brothers are driving our entire nation toward a fatal head-on collision with the Soviet Union. In a harshly worded article in Pravda only 12 days ago, Russia warned the West that we are now riding, quote, a tide that is carrying those who swim in it toward the cliffs of confrontation." Unquote. Topic No. 2. Earlier this month, on July 12, an unusual high-level meeting at the White House made some news. Key members of Congress had been summoned there by Jimmy Carter to discuss public disclosures of top-secret information. Present from Congress were ranking members of the Senate and House Committees on Intelligence, as well as Democratic and Republican Party leaders. 
In addition, the meeting included Secretary of State Vance, Secretary of Defense Brown, National Security Chief Brzezinski, and Admiral Turner, the head of the CIA. After the meeting, Senators who were interviewed fumed as usual about damage to national security quote unquote, due to disclosures they refused to identify. But the key reason for this strange meeting is reflected in the following line from the New York Times report about it that day. Quote, Today's meeting reportedly was originally scheduled for May or early June when the Administration was concerned about the disclosure of information in connection with the downing of a South Korean airliner in the Soviet Union." Unquote. My friends, the disclosures that provoked the White House meeting were those in my AUDIO LETTER No. 33 of three months ago. In that broadcast I told you the complete story about the strange case of Korean Airlines Flight 902. It strayed into militarily sensitive Soviet airspace and was shot down while Secretary of State Vance was in Moscow. In my AUDIO LETTER for that month I revealed that the Korean airliner episode was not accidental but was an intelligence mission for the CIA, and I told you in detail why it was necessary. I told you these things, my friends, because you have a legitimate right to know. The Carter Administration is boiling mad at me now for telling you, and would like nothing better than to silence the Dr. Beter AUDIO LETTER. Failing that, the Government would like to cut off my sources. That was the underlying motive for the White House meeting of July 12. But my friends, my most important intelligence sources are far higher than those currently available to any committee on Capitol Hill, and I can assure you that I told you nothing about the Korean 707 incident that was not already known within the walls of the Kremlin. As I told you in AUDIO LETTER No. 33, the United States no longer has any spy satellites in orbit that can observe the Soviet Union. A year ago this month, on July 17, 1977, the first in the new generation of Russian killer satellites called Cosmos Interceptors was launched. Called Cosmos 929, it was manned and armed with a charged particle beam weapon, a weapon which the United States tried but failed to develop. After two months of painstaking checkout and testing, it was used for the first time against an American target on September 20, 1977. As an American spy satellite passed directly over the Petrozovotsk Observatory in northern Russia, it was blasted into an enormous fireball in space by Cosmos 929. The fireball was witnessed over 300 miles away in Helsinki, Finland, and it made headlines in the United States as a strange jellyfish-like UFO. By that time Cosmos 929 had been joined in space by Cosmos 954, which was armed with a neutron particle beam for a very special task. In the Battle of the Harvest Moon a week later, the crew of Cosmos 954 bombarded the American moon base in Copernicus Crater with neutron radiation that killed all of the male and female British, Canadian, and American astronauts there. Immediately on the evening of September 27, 1977, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko delivered an ultimatum to the White House. As I revealed that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, this was the reason for Gromyko's sudden, highly unusual nighttime meeting with Jimmy Carter and Secretary of State Vance. The following month, October 1977, there was an epidemic of fireballs in the sky, especially over Russia. Six more Russian Cosmos interceptors were orbited that month, and they were shooting down America's spy satellites. Meanwhile the Soviet Union was on full military alert, 
and the United States was surrounded by almost the entire Russian submarine fleet in attack positions. Not all of the American satellites destroyed in October 1977 by Russia were mere spy satellites. As I revealed that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 27, the 85-ton space station called Skylab was shot down on October 18, 1977. This was done over the United States, creating a mammoth fireball that was witnessed in Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Missouri. Nine days later NASA began the cover-up about Skylab. The events from late September 1977 onward threw the controlled Carter Administration to panicky confusion. By November 18 the situation with our dwindling spy satellites was becoming critical. On that day the Voice of America was used to hurl a threat of preemptive war against Russia if destruction of our spy satellites did not stop, but the Russian Navy ended this desperate bluff by the Carter Administration by swarming once again into position for a nuclear attack. Pressure on the controlled Carter Administration mounted steadily through the end of 1977, but an unexpected stay of execution was brought about by the illness of Leonid Brezhnev which ended with his death in Moscow on January 7, 1978. A few weeks later Leonid Brezhnev No. 2, the ceremonial double seen in public these days, made his appearance. Meanwhile behind the scenes the new top man in the Kremlin was rapidly emerging, although so far without public acknowledgement of the fact. His name? Marshal Dmitry Ustinov the Soviet Defense Minister. After learning of the death of the real Brezhnev, our secret rulers began breathing a little easier, but wrongly so. They expected that there would be major power struggles within the Kremlin for two to three years before a clear, strong successor to Brezhnev could emerge. During that period of internal turmoil Russia would be in a poor position to go to war in spite of her overwhelming military might. Meanwhile the Rockefeller Brothers believed it would be possible by means of crash weapons programs to construct a counter to the Russian threat. Even before Brezhnev's death, and even earlier than the disastrous loss of America's secret moon base, our secret rulers were taking measures to promote internal turmoil in Russia. When Brezhnev died, these measures took on added importance. A cardinal rule that the Rockefeller Brothers have always followed is to support not only their faction in power but also their opposition. This applies to their political intrigues everywhere, including the Soviet Union. In the wake of the Soviet underwater missile crisis of two years ago, the first reaction of the Rockefeller Brothers was to try to undo the Russian double-cross and to reinstate the former secret alliance. But they also began preparing to unleash their own controlled opposition inside Russia against the present ruling faction in the Kremlin. A year ago this month David Rockefeller made a secret trip to Moscow. While there he did more than confer with leaders of the present regime. More importantly, he contacted his opposition leaders and instructed them to go all out to disrupt and undermine the present Russian regime. And back at home in the United States the controlled major media were soon building up the dissident issue as never before. When Brezhnev died last January, the Rockefeller Brothers were elated. It looked as if the old Rockefeller luck was going to see them through once again, as it had always done in the past. The protracted Kremlin power struggles that they anticipated were sure to hurt Russia's ability to wage war, and the internal distractions facing the Kremlin would be made worse by fast-building dissonant agitation, which was to be highlighted in the Western press. All in all, the prospects for a breather in which to get new weapons in place looked very encouraging. 
but our secret rulers badly underestimated their Kremlin adversaries. The Rockefeller brothers simply do not understand the self-styled spiritual Communists who run Russia today, about whom I first told you in AUDIO LETTER No. 28. They have an unprecedented unity of purpose and mutual respect that unites them, and as a result Russian rulers were able to achieve a transition to a workable new structure of relationships within two months after Brezhnev's death. And so six months to the day after Gromyko delivered the Harvest Moon ultimatum at the White House, the new Kremlin leadership renewed that ultimatum. On March 27, 1978, Pravda warned that the United States was about to have its last chance to accept a SALT to Accord, which was to be our Surrender Treaty. The Carter Administration and its Rockefeller bosses were stunned. In an incredibly short time the Russians were signaling their readiness again to go to war, and here our rulers sat stripped by then of all orbital surveillance capabilities over Russia by Cosmos Interceptor Killer Satellites. The result? As Secretary of State Vance went to Moscow to discuss SALT II was the Korean Airliner Intelligence Mission that I explained for you in AUDIO LETTER No. 33. It's now clear to our secret rulers that they may have far less time to prepare for war than they hoped only a few short months ago for it will not be internal turmoil that will dictate the timetable of Soviet actions, but Russian military strategy. This is the real message of the celebrated dissident trials of recent days. Bolshevik dissidents simply will not be tolerated. The Kremlin's concern is different in the case of dissidents like Alexander Ginsburg. Ginsburg is a practicing member of the Russian Orthodox Church. He is a reformer in the same vein as Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who has spoken out publicly in Ginsburg's defense. As I explained last month, the Kremlin rulers of today are determined to take the lid off and promote spiritual rebirth in Russia, but they intend to do it in a gradual way that does not get out of hand. And so our secret rulers, the Rockefeller brothers, are finding themselves checkmated at every turn by the Russians. Crash weapons projects are underway, but there's no guarantee that there will be enough time for any of them to bear fruit. So in desperation our rulers are now preparing to play the last card in their military deck. Last September 1977 the Battle of the Harvest Moon brought about a sudden dramatic shift in the East-West military balance in Russia's favor. Time is running out for the Rockefeller Brothers, and nothing less than an equally sudden and dramatic shift in the opposite direction offers any hope for survival of the Rockefeller Empire. There's no time now to start from scratch on new military technologies to counter Russia. A few advanced weapons which have already reached readiness for production can be rushed ahead but even that will be cut short by Soviet sabotage and other events. But there is one very major factor in the military equation which can be changed overnight, and that is strategy. As I've pointed out in other AUDIO LETTERS, the most powerful ingredient in any military strategy is surprise, and experience has shown that an aggressor attacking by surprise can often defeat an enemy that is vastly superior in strength. Our secret rulers have now concluded that this is the only way left against Russia. As a result, the United States of America has now embarked on a drastic new course that is without precedent in American history. For the very first time the master military strategy of our secret rulers is for the United States to wage preemptive war against another nation. The Carter Administration is moving as rapidly as possible now to position itself to launch a massive nuclear surprise attack on the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies. Over the past two decades 
the so-called doves among Rockefeller agents both in and out of government have duped the American people into laying down our arms. Always we were told that our military strength might make the Soviets fear a first strike by us. But now that the Rockefeller-Soviet Alliance has been dissolved by the new leaders in the Kremlin, we suddenly stand naked because of their treachery. And now it is the United States that is preparing for a first strike, not because of our strength but because of our weakness. Having decided upon this last-ditch strategy, the Rockefeller Brothers are making kamikaze pilots of every man, woman, and child in the United States. In connection with the new First Strike strategy, the Carter Administration is pouring thousands of personnel and equipment, especially aircraft, into Great Britain and Europe. Long abandoned airfields in England are being hastily reactivated over citizen protests there. Meanwhile the Carter Administration is doing everything it can to distract the Russians, while at the same time building up war tensions. If possible, the Rockefellers want their planned nuclear attack on Russia to appear justified or even defensive to the world. To this end you should keep your eyes open for a major incident or series of incidents very soon. Just as in the case of the Korean 707 incident, my friends, I'm only relaying to you what the new Russian leaders already know. This is why the Kremlin is now adopting such public defiance of the West in the dissonant trials and other matters, and this is why just a few days ago Pravda did not shrink from saying in so many words that we are heading for, quote, the cliffs of confrontation, unquote. Topic No. 3. In the aftermath of NUCLEAR WAR one, the world as we know it today will have passed into history. Future generations, as they survey the century that preceded NUCLEAR WAR one, will be struck by the needless tragedy of it all and by the mass blindness that made it inevitable. They will have difficulty even in comprehending the modern Western civilization of 1978 because that civilization will be extinct. But they will read, they will study, and they will learn. Historians of the future, of course, will be able to see clearly what is only dimly perceived today in 1978. They will be able to explain to their readers how, in the final months before NUCLEAR WAR one, both the United States and the Soviet Union adopted a preemptive war stance. They will explain how Russia and America stalked each other like wrestlers preparing to grapple each looking for a weak opening to begin the contest. And they will tell the sad story of how the West committed suicide by following the United States into a war we could not possibly win. It is only natural that tomorrow's history books will dwell at length upon the deaths and damage suffered by the Soviet Union in NUCLEAR WAR one. In this way the major historians of that day to come will illustrate the heroism of the victorious side Russia, but great attention will also have to be given to the enormous man-made cataclysm that engulfed the West. By comparison, the war sufferings of Russia will have been a mere scratch on the arm. In speaking of the ruined United States of America, the historians will speak in hushed and somber tones. America's epitaph will include the words, Preemptive Nuclear War, quote, unquote. It is the final suicidal American strategy that history will blame for the completeness of America's destruction. This suicidal strategy, my friends, has been brought about by the very forces of Bolshevism, whose absolute eradication has been vowed by the spiritual Communists who rule Russia today, and history will relate that this plan will have removed the last ounce of restraint from Kremlin actions. Even for Russian historians, America's end will be a painful thing to describe, for Russia will ultimately employ all of her military resources in order to utterly destroy all traces of American military power worldwide. Not only missiles and bombers will be involved, but also the secret Soviet weapons I've told you about 
over the past two years. These include the short-range underwater nuclear missiles launched from our own territorial waters, radio-chemical warfare, and clouds dispersed from submarines and canisters at sea to bring on the totally artificial ailment now known as Legionnaire's disease, powerful microwave satellites which can derange the judgment of naval personnel just as was done to tanker crews over a year and a half ago, geophysical warfare shattering the Philippines and other military targets and laying waste America's west coast, charged particle beam superweapons fired at Earth targets from the seven Russian bases that are already operational on the near side of the moon, and, my friends, the Russian Cosmospheres about which the late General Thomas Power tried in vain to warn America long ago, as I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 32, and which are now on battle stations over the United States targeting Air Force fields, dams, reservoirs, lakes, and other strategic points worldwide. And after all that, the invasion and occupation of what remains of America by the Soviet Army from staging points now being established in Canada and Mexico. The historians of tomorrow will move on to tell their readers how America's final desperate strategy of preemptive war led to selected nuclear and particle beam attacks on Europe and great devastation in England. Because, my friends, the Rockefeller shift to a first-strike strategy is transforming all of our forces overseas into offensive invasion forces. For that reason, all American troop concentrations, military installations everywhere on Earth will be subjected to attack. In Europe, these attacks will be surgical in nature, sparing areas that do not harbor American forces. England, however, is working hand-in-hand -hand with the Rockefeller Brothers now and will be hit very hard. Yes, my friends, the final chapter in the history of modern Western civilization will have to be written by historians of another civilization which will survive the West. That civilization is the Eastern Orthodox Christian civilization centered on Russia. But as they close the book on the West as we know it, Tomorrow's historians will begin writing a new, brighter chapter for mankind as a whole. The promise, contrary to the expectations of most, is for a rebirth of true human freedom in the age to come. The selfish and self-destructive license of today will be stamped out, but it will give way to real human freedom rooted in eternal spiritual values. Already the so-called spiritual Communists who rule Russia today are making their plans for the future after they have disposed of the curse of Bolshevism worldwide. They have wrestled control of Russia away from the atheistic Bolshevist Communist, and they have dissolved the former secret alliance between the Soviet Union and the Rockefeller rulers of America. They are striking out on their own now, and for years they have been quietly studying all the implications of such a course of action. For the long run, the most fundamental implications of severing Russia's ties with the United States are not military but economic. For most of the six decades following the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, the Soviet Union depended for its very existence upon massive and continuing transfusions from the West. In past AUDIO LETTERS I reviewed all this in detail, but having severed these ties now, Russia must stand on her own two feet. Therefore the Kremlin has been actively pursuing economic studies in order to determine what course is the proper one to follow economically, and they are being objective about it because they know Russia's very survival depends on it. One of the most fundamental results of these Russian economic studies was mentioned last month by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his speech at Harvard. This item was not quoted in any of the major media reviews to my knowledge but it was one of the most important points he made. I am referring to the Russian mathematician who, as Solzhenitsyn said, proved two years ago that Socialism in any form is inherently self-destructive economically and otherwise. The present Kremlin rulers have accepted this verdict, and recently Radio Moscow proudly announced that Russian agriculture, which used to be almost totally collectivized, is now up to one-third private enterprise. These are indeed turbulent times, my friends, and the day is not far off when the political scene we see today will be no more. 
But what about the economic scene for now? Many of you have written to ask where one can go to escape the coming war and to help preserve assets. My answer for now is that certain parts of Europe will be safe, such as southern France, Spain, and the tiny villages in the mountainous areas there. As you know, I have recommended several financial newsletters in the past which are written in the United States, but the one which I like best, which is published abroad, is coming out of a tiny country called Andorra, which is in the Pyrenees between Spain and France. I consider this newsletter to be the financial voice of Europe. It's called the IMAC, IMAC Commodities Newsletter. Free information about it is available by writing to CAPA, C-A-P-A, Mosen Tremosa 1, Andorra. The spelling is M-O-S-S-E-N, capital T-R-E-M-O-S-A, 1, Andorra, A-N-D-O-R-R-A, Europe. To give you an idea of what the IMAC Commodities Newsletter has to offer, I quote from the July 7, 1978 issue of The Professional Investor, which is a watchdog of the investment industry and published at Popano Beach, Florida, ZIP 33061. Quote, IMAC has been consistently more accurate than most United States publications over the past two years in analyzing and forecasting the fate of the dollar, Wall Street, the United States economy, and gold. Perhaps even more interesting is the very astute political commentary offered gratis in most issues of IMAC. Don't let the word commodities in the title of the newsletter throw you off. While there is heavy emphasis on commodities, the letter covers far more." End of quotation from the professional investor. My friends, let no one suppose that the days ahead will be easy, for we are about to undergo a trial by fire, economically, politically, militarily, and spiritually. But like the rainbow that follows the storm, beauty and true human freedom will once again shine forth one day on the face of the earth. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.